All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all for bearing with me trying to get my technology. It's different everywhere I go, so trying to get it together. I'm Rachel Jenga. I'm one of the PBIS ISF consultants at the Kentucky Department of Education. And um, this is gonna be my fourth year there. Prior to that, I was a classroom teacher, second grade, special education. I've been a para. I've helped be a bus monitor, long-term sub. So I definitely had some experience um, in the classroom. I worked at the same school in Fayette County for about the last 10 years prior to KDE. And I worked at a school that started implementing PBIS, positive behavior interventions and supports. And I wish I knew now, well, you know, way back then, 10 years ago, because it's really hard that first year teaching. You go in and you've had all the classes and you think you know it all, and then when you go in, it is nothing like they teach you in class, I think. <laughs> I was like, just a few, a very few of the things did I learn from school. Um, I want you guys just to be present, be alert, you know, silence your phones, but take care of your needs. If you need to go to the restroom, whatever, take care of your all selves because that's really important to make sure that you all are taking care of your own needs. Today, we're going to start with some objectives. So to obtain information about positive behavior interventions and supports in the classroom, and to review tier one interventions to start the school, re school year and refresh classroom strategies with a proactive approach, whether you're virtual or in person, does, you know, now we don't, never know when it's gonna go, go back to virtual or things are so different than it was, you know, a few years ago. One of the things I always do, I'm a pug person, pug owner, so I always have to have a pug something in my slide. <laughs> so, um, just do a group check-in, and you guys can do this at your table. Just turn to your neighbor and give them three words that you're feeling today. You might not can read this, but just tell them three words that you feel today. <laughs> I had so much caffeine, I'm like... <laughs> okay, we'll come back. So this is just a way to check in with your groups and your classrooms. One of the things that I suggest is kind of getting to know how your students are feeling or even your team members. Because your team members, usually you can tell by their face when they come in what their day is going to be like. Or if they've forgotten their coffee or, you know, maybe they got a flat tire on the way from work. But this is a good way to check in with your staff and your students in the building. And this is just called name it entertainment and it's permission to feel the way that you do. Um, sometimes we have those good days, sometimes we have those bad days, but no matter what, we come in the classroom every single day. And we have all these little eyes on us waiting for us to do what we need to do for them. So regardless of what you're feeling, you got to leave it at the door. Come in fresh every single day because they need you.
So one of the reasons I show that video is because I think, you know, when we start the school year out, um, raise your hand if you could probably resonate with one thing in that video. I know I could. So it could be a student, it could be something that you're personally dealing with. But how we respond to kids is ultimately going to determine what our classroom looks like. And a lot of times we often say, that kid is so bad. Oh, you know, he's rough, he's this, he's that. Most of the time, the students that are acting out, you know, we all know there's something else going on. So we want to make sure that we're really looking into what that might be and being considerate and just thinking about, you know, how can we do things differently when we know the kids that are coming in from all these different situations. Um, so PBIS, it is a data-driven um, decision-making framework. I'm not going to go into everything today because I really want to just get you guys through the strategies. But one of the things I want you to think about is how you teach every day. It's not just content. If you can't have your classroom management under control, you're never going to get to the content. Or you're going to struggle trying to teach the content because you've got so many kids interrupting or not doing what they're supposed to do. And it can be stressful and it can be frustrating. And then, you know, all of those things is going to make for a long year. So I encourage you to focus your first three days of your classroom um, teaching teaching your classroom management. That means teaching the kids what are your expectations for them from the time they come to your door to the time that they come into the classroom and sit down. What does that look like? It's gonna look different for every single teacher because your classroom is different, your group of students is different, but what is it gonna look like for you? We can't discipline a student if we haven't taught them the expected uh, behavior that we expect from them. So if you want them to come to your door every morning and say, Hello, Mrs. Jones. Good morning. Go straight and hang their backpack up. Get their things out, put it in their desk, start their morning work. What does that look like? What is your procedures for that? Because you want to practice that with your students. And it sounds crazy, but kids don't know what they don't know. So we can't discipline a student if you haven't taught them what your expectation is. So you have to teach all of those things, whether it's reading group, what does that look like? How do they sharpen a pencil? What does that look like? I know it sounds ridiculous and it can be redundant, but it's gonna make your school year so much better because they know what that looks like. Practice it, practice it, practice it, model it. Show them, have them show you what it's supposed to look like. Continue that process so that you guys can see they know the expectations, then you can get to the content and the things that you're trying to get to. Um, even from the time they log on to a computer, to the time that um, they're going to transition somewhere in the hallway. We know transitions can be really hard. Part of my job is looking at the state behavior data. And one of the things I would tell you, classroom management is the highest of all discipline issues. So it's always in the classroom. So that tells me that, you know, somebody's struggling or, you know, maybe they haven't been able to get a behavior under control, but that is where also the kids feel safest. So they feel like they can act up in front of you and you're still going to love them, you know? They know that it's just like being a parent. You know, our kids act worse for us than they do anybody else. So just remember that if you can't, you can't discipline them until you've taught it to them. So um, PBIS is built on those data, outcomes, <coughs> systems, practices that you put in place every single day. Today we're going to focus on um, tier one, which is that green, which is like 85% of your students. Um, or 80% of your students, you're going to come in and you're going to think, what am I going to do for every single student in this building or in my classroom? What does that look like in my classroom? That's going to be the content you teach, the behavior management you have in place, all the social emotional learning components that you might have in place in your classroom. Um, mental health we know is a big issue before all the things that's happened up until this point in the U.S. and in our area. So focusing on what that looks like in your classroom, relationship building, having building a community in your classroom. One of the things that I would encourage you all to do is think about how you can build a classroom community. Because those kids are gonna be together from here until their senior year, hopefully. So you want them to have those strong relationships and get to know each other and have those good, strong foundations. It's funny because if you have special education students that are with a group, I've noticed as the years go on, the kids that they grew up with always kind of support and look after them when you have that close-knit community. I'm 
going to skip through some of this because I didn't want you all to have to go through that. But I will tell you, so when you have positive behavior interventions and supports in your classroom, you're going to have your academic, better academic performance, better social-emotional emotional competency, social and academic outcomes, reduced bullying behavior, um, decreased rates of student-reported drug or alcohol abuse, less disciplinary issues. You all are going to see changes just by getting your classroom management into place. You're going to get better outcomes for academics and everything else in your classroom. So in tier one, which is for everyone in the classroom, I want you all to think about how you're going to use your data in the classroom. How are you going to collect your data? What kind of data are you going to collect? We know we've got our grade book. Okay, do we collect behavior data? Absolutely. What's that going to look like? In your classroom um, you know if you've got a behavior chart so you can kind of keep up with things that are happening so that you can go back and look and say okay um, Bron, <laughs> she is a problem child and she will not quit interrupting class but it's at 905 every day well at 905 she acts a fool you know why because she don't want to go out in the hallway and she don't want to transition to another classroom because she doesn't like change. But how will I know that if I'm not marking these things down and trying to figure it out? So making sure you know you have your dates and times of things that are happening, whether it's not transitioning well or talking too much in the classroom or maybe it's our class that's the issue. Maybe this one student and our teacher have an adult child argument, you know. We are human. We don't all get along with each other. You all can probably think in your head right now of a student that was hard for you or maybe an adult that's hard for you in your life. It's human nature. We're not always going to get along. But if you don't monitor your behavior data, you're not going to know what the problem is and you're not going to be able to find a way to fix it if you can't record it, look at it, be able to go back over it each week. And I would encourage you to do that, especially if you have students that are really struggling. And find a good... I always say you have to find what works for you when you're collecting data, what makes sense to you. Um, if you don't have a school-wide data collection plan that's already in place and you're going to create your own table or whatever, make it work for you and what is easiest for you because I think working harder or working smarter, not harder, is what I believe in. So we're going to work on discouraging problem behavior and encouraging expected behavior. A lot of times we're very reactive um, when it comes to behavior. We react after something happens. But what I want you to think about doing in your school year is being proactive. Think about the things that need to be taught. Think about the ways that you're going to handle behavior. It's so important to be proactive about it. Plan for the things that can happen. Um, you're always going to have some students, and I always say tier two students or tier three students' behavior that are going to be a little bit more intense. They can't handle just your regular everyday classroom management. They might need a little more support. So you're going to have those students, but um, you know, I just want you today we're just going to focus on the tier one, but you will have students. And as a new teacher, oh man, you stress about writing behavior referrals because you don't want your teacher or your principal to think, I can't handle classroom management. But here's the thing, what if you can't? What if you need support? Because I was terrified to write up a referral because I thought that my principal was gonna be like, oh man, she can't do this. I needed help. My first year was rough. Um, I had some of the toughest kids, and even now they're still tough, but um, they've graduated and moved on, but those kids were tough. I didn't think I was gonna make it. It, it was hard. My first long-term, um, sub position and I've told this several times that my friends here they've heard it I was in a classroom high school classroom and man I had 70 minutes blocks well my fourth block period was the longest 70 minutes of my life I thought I cannot do this and you all if you've already been teaching you probably know which students I'm talking about because it's the ones that just man they stole from me they would fight they would argue they would fuss they would Oh, they were the worst of the worst. One of them specifically would come in. He'd slam that door open. Within 20 minutes, he'd call me whatever name he wanted to. He's rolled around the floor, acted a fool, and walked out. And I thought, i got to do something because I'm not going to be able to do this. If, you know, it was a long-term sub, and I thought, this is my opportunity to get a full-time teaching position. 
So, you know, I was like, I, I don't want them to mess it up and I don't want to mess it up, so what do I do? So I got to know this student. Both parents were in the household. Both parents were great. Found out where he went to church. Got to know his Sunday school teacher. She was my neighbor. So I looked for all those supports in his life that could help me try to figure out how to connect with him. And he liked food, which I like food. So um, I started feeding him Jello moose cups to do his work, sugar free, but he loved them. And it was just to start, I was like, if he finished this, because he said, that looks good. I said, well, if you want to try it, finish your work and I'll give you one. It started with that. Little things. Who would have thought, you know, a high schooler would want a Jello pudding cup? But lo and behold, it started building a relationship. Little things, little positive interactions that I started having with him. Got better and better and better. He was failing. He wasn't going. He wasn't doing very well his junior year. And by the end of the year, just to get to the end of the story, he had all A's. He was coming to class. He was being respectful. On Mother's Day, I got the Mother's Day uh, basket of cookies from his cooking class, along with his mom. So it was a lot of push and pull at the beginning. I had to get to know what was going on in his life. And he was just a little spoiled, just so y'all know. <laughs> he did have that good family background. He did come from a lot of different um, positive things in his life, but he just didn't like school because he couldn't read very well and he was a junior in high school. He couldn't write very well because he was a junior in high school. People had just pushed him through because it was easier to push him on through than deal with his behavior. So when you have that student, do not give up on them. Fight through it, push through it, do, it, do whatever it takes. If you need help, I encourage you to ask the people around you. Those well-seasoned teachers, they have strategies. They might have a better relationship with that student. They might know the family. They might can give you some background you didn't know. I encourage you to not give up. Because now, that young man is the godfather of my, my grandchild. So, you know, it took a lot. And I was like, and I was telling them, I have another um, child in that class that was pretty rough, and now he's my son-in-law, so be careful of those relationships, y'all. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, it's the, it's the never giving up part. There's going to be hard students and hard days, and I will tell you the one piece of advice my friend told me, find one thing you like about a student that's hard. Start with that, because it's going to take you having to come up with one thing that you can think about. One of my students that was tough, he was very smart. I didn't know how smart he was. I just knew he drove me nuts. I had to find one thing I liked. That's what she told me. She said, so tomorrow I'll find one thing you like. He got a new haircut. He came in. I said, hey, I love your hair. That started it. So I started trying to find things that I could relate to with him. Then all of a sudden I started getting to know him a little better and understanding that he was extremely bored. He didn't want to be in class because he was so far advanced that his mind couldn't stay on track with what I was doing. He ended up going to a gifted and talented program. But I was young and I didn't know. I just knew that he was driving me nuts. So there's going to be students that you're not sure about that you're going to struggle with, and it's normal, and it's just part of teaching. And then there's going to be the students that's always going to have the right answer and, you know, do all the right things. Uh, so we're not going to take that full time, but I want you guys to just take a minute at the table and talk about ways that you all might collect this behavior data. I want you all to think about, you know, of course you're going to have the name on there, right? What could that look like in your classroom? What's it going to look like for you? One of the things I will tell you that people always miss is having a column for motivation, which means what is causing this behavior? What could be possible motives for them to do this? You know, have some little notes for you to keep for yourself because that way you can start investigating, you know, trying to figure out why a kid's acting out is like a puzzle piece. And it can be the craziest things. I've had one that didn't like the perfume that I wore because it smelled like his mom who had just passed away. So there's things that we don't know or think about when we go into the classroom. And it can be some of the strangest things. It can be from them getting the wrong cereal in the cafeteria line to not getting the drink before they came in the door. But, you know, we have to figure out what's causing those behaviors. So just take a minute and talk about data collection, what that might look like in your classroom this year.
It's funny, I had a kid that liked dirt bikes. My dad had a dirt bike shop. And it, <laughs> we were finally able to connect at some level, and it had been like six months of not getting to know him. And I finally liked bikes, then it. It is. That's like the first thing in it. Is that Miss Payne was you went first? It's so true. That's the shame. It is so true. You learn the bad ones. You do. You sure do. Because the other ones are just kind of under the radar. We have a system keeping track of all the misbehavior. We don't have a system for keeping track of things. And that's one of the things I was going to talk about, too. So, yeah, because I know that was how it was for me students that are under the radar, you know, and doing all the right things. guys we're going to come back I love the conversations you all are having and it's funny because we talked about the kids that we get to know first at this table who was saying hey we get to know the kids that are exhibiting all those behaviors first because well let's say they want to be seen and heard and we get to know those kids really quick and we keep a record for those kids but what about the kids that are doing things right and it is hard because a lot of times I can tell you my first year teaching my interactions with the good kids was limited compared to the kids that I had that were making, you know, bad choices. But the kids that were making good choices, I didn't interact with them as much because I didn't need to. That was the wrong answer. <laughs> I wish somebody would have told me back then, you know, you really need to focus on those kids too because I was so focused on getting the behavior under control. And it's hard to find that balance. But, you know, one of the things I will tell you, I literally... I put notes, and you might get one of these during my training today, and I would take it and stick it on their desk. And it's just a positive interaction to the kids that struggled um, getting seen or heard because I was so focused on the kids that were, you know, causing the chaos or disruptions. So I would put a little note on their door, like, or on their desk later, I learned how to do this, not my first year, not my second year, probably like my third or fourth year. And I started putting notes like, hey, thank you for listening. You're doing a great job. Thanks for always making good choices. Just little notes that are important to them um, and makes them feel better. That's one of the ways that I try to have those positive interactions or have lunch with them or give them some things because most of my day was spent trying to put out fires, you know? Um, so trying to be proactive though instead of reactive will help you limit the amount of fires you have to put out. Teach those behaviors that you expect in your classroom. One of the things I'll tell you about collecting data, think about your referrals that you have on each student, um, location time, student, day of the week, grade, whatever, you know, wherever their location was, all those things helps you determine, um, is this really what, um, what I need from these students? Like, what can I do to change their behavior? But you have to have those things in place. And I loved hearing the conversations because at every table, it became about the relationship because you can't get behavior under control until you have a relationship with that student. And that can be the hardest part because sometimes it's hard for us too to get past that 
they wore me out, but at the end of the day, they're still a student. They need your attention for some reason or the other. They're acting out for some reason. They don't just come in with um, these behaviors. And they don't know. Kids don't know what they don't know. We can't expect them to come to school. They've ne some of them have never been to school before. So we can't get upset when they don't know something. It's just like adults. We don't know what we don't know, so the kids don't either. Uh, so let's look at, I'm just going to show you a brief minute of this because I want to get to the um, activities of what you can be doing in the classroom for the first of the year. Did you see that? Why would somebody do that? Please go into the classroom, no talking, quietly. Hey, Ms. Mara, what's how you doing? We need you inside. How do you think that makes us feel? I forgot my number. What's your name? Jordan. What's your last name? Carter. School is hard enough. Come on in, sit down quietly at your desk and begin writing. This kind of stuff just makes it harder. I said quietly, please. Who's talking? Is it you, Sophie? Don't let it be you. Don't believe me? Please just what? I'm going to just stop it there. And the reason being is time, because I do want to get you guys to um, the activities that you can take back in your classroom. You all, when students come in, get to know their names, give them a smile. I know that lunch lady, I'm going to tell you all, we had her at our school at one point. Um, you know, she would yell at me for not knowing my adult number. Um, so I was terrified of her. But these, are, these kids need you all. You, this is every interaction you have with them is an opportunity to build a relationship or make or break their day. So just remember that when they're coming in. My son watched this. I have a 23-year-old and a three, well, now four-year-old. Um, so when I was doing this at work, you know, at home, I was working on the video, and he said he hadn't started school yet. He just started preschool. He was like, I don't want to go to school. Like, he got very twerp when he saw that first part of the video. I didn't realize he was even watching. And that was one kid feeling that way. And I thought, and it was my kid, which made it worse. <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is real life. This happens, and sometimes we get so caught up in what we're doing make sure you're acknowledging those students and giving them the smile even when it's hard because they need it. So I want us to focus on procedures um, for the classroom. Uh, looking into your social emotional learning, we know students need the same things. They're struggling mentally. One of the things that I did with you guys was that check-in. You can do that at any grade level. Put a little smiley face on the desk of your students. Have them, if they're lower level, have them do the smiley face or the sad face or what they're feeling. More intermediate students, let them use some of the words. Give them a word box that they can choose the words that they're feeling that day. More advanced students, have them write a sentence. High school students, have them write a journal entry about what they're feeling. How did their night go? Respond back to it. I know it's a lot of work, but I had one that would say, I like tacos every single day. But by like a month later, <laughs> he finally asked, do you like tacos? <laughs> so it was like, you know, just, <laughs> You know, you gotta keep going, don't give up. You'll eventually get them. And now one of those kids I'm still really close with. Um, so, you know, it's hard, but we have to keep doing those things. We have to give them reasons to keep interacting and to not give up hope. Um, be intentional with your implementation. There's a lot of good social emotional learning programs if your school doesn't have one. There's Heart Sanford Harmony. You guys, this is a free program. It has lesson plans built in K through six already. That's a great thing because you can already have your class meeting set up. The lesson's already there for you. All you gotta do is implement it. And it's free. And I'm all about free. They have the stories that go with the lessons. I just learned about this on Microsoft Teams. If you download the app, there's a new program called um, Microsoft Reflect. It's a check-in program. So kids could come in and check in on the computer every day and let you know how they're doing and you could keep up with that data. And it already kind of aggregates it for you so you can kind of see, oh man, half of my class is really struggling. Or maybe there's some specific lessons that they feel like you need to pull out and they'll give you that information in the lessons for it. So it's really a good program check into that. Again, it's free. And you can see um, about growing your emotional vocabulary, developing 
growth mindset and confidence, and it, you can put your class, your students in. Just a good way to check in. That could be at any level. Acknowledge efforts. Plan to reteach and restructure as needed. You might have a day where the kids are just off the charts, especially after breaks. Long breaks are the worst. When they come back, spend a day or two, maybe even three, reteaching your behavior expectations because they probably need the practice. And that's a way to get your behavior back under control before you lose it. Because when students come back, they've forgotten everything they learned from day one. I don't know what it is about having that break, but it could be two days, three days, they come back, they have forgotten everything. Um, allow students to, um, to work into the process of your teaching expectations. Use kids to make videos about teaching expectations. High school students love doing this. Having them show them how to get from one end of the hallway to the other in a certain amount of time. That's one of my favorite videos that I teach in one of my PBIS lessons. It was a high school student. He's like, I'm going to make it here in three minutes. I got three minutes to get to class. He's passing everybody. He's like, I don't have time to talk to you because I'm not a player. And it was like a group of girls. I don't have time to talk to you because I'll talk to you guys in the afternoon. He just keeps moving. We know that doesn't always happen in high school world. But it was a great little video to just kind of show different ways to develop your positive behavior interventions in your classroom and in your school. Um, you know, teach in context. We're adults, we know when to dress up, we know when to dress down, we know how to act in certain places. We, it might look a lot different out with our girlfriends or guys on a Friday night than we do on a Monday morning in a classroom. So, you know, teach in context. Teach them what it looks like in the bathroom, teach them what it looks like in the hallway, what your expectations are in every area in the building. Cafeteria, special area. If you're gonna have people coming in to do um, you know, like the special events. What does that look like? You know, you have to teach these things because they're not going to know if you don't teach them. And I'll let you guys read this. This is just one of my favorite things um, that are one of my little favorite quotes because I also do a, teach it on the bus, but it's true on every aspect of classroom. You have to practice it if you want to be good at it. Same for behavior. You want your kids to practice it no matter what age level until they're good at it. And then kids start to know, if, you know, what you're doing. They kind of catch on whatever programs you're using in the classroom. I'm behaving well. Are you sure you wouldn't like to positively reinforce it? Because they know if they're being good, they might get a piece of candy. They might get a sticker. They might get a kind work. Everything you give them does not have to be tangible, okay? It can be just like the stick it notes or the kind words or, you know, time with you at recess, maybe a two-minute uh, meeting with the teacher. Kids love that. Even high school students enjoy having a safe place to eat lunch, maybe if the cafeteria is overwhelming. I didn't know kids in high school level would like lunch passes with a teacher or, you know, they, like, they love snacks, just like everybody else. You know, there was things that I didn't realize that those kids still, honestly, even at the grade level, they all like the same things, you know, like elementary and high school. So using the AirPod, AirPods was a big thing too having kids allow them to have a little music time throughout the day. You want to acknowledge your students. So if you don't have a classroom acknowledgement system, you know, start thinking about what you can do to acknowledge your students and give them positive rewards. Um, our school had dragon dollars. So, you know, they could earn the dollars to purchase something at a store at the end of the week. We had dragon dots for school-wide so that we were able to do it school wide are the kids making good choices all through the school year um, in the hallways and things like that that was one of the big things was having a school wide acknowledgement system you know and if your school doesn't have that you can always talk to your principal as an idea like hey let's do something school wide so that the kids if they're in the hallways they're making good choices anything that you can do to you know positively reinforce behavior helps the students behavior go down dramatically and then I cannot get this to look any different. Sorry, you guys, on this slide. Five to one. If I'm going to tell a student, or I see a student doing something that I may not like, first thing I want to do is go over and be like, stop talking, you know, or put that down, or put it back in your desk. Or what, I want you all to think about five positive things you can say to that student, to that one negative. Because if all you're having is negative interactions with a kid, what are, you, what are you going to get from them? Probably nothing much, are you? 
Because if you're given positives, they're going to be more likely to work for you if you're given positive interactions instead of negative. So I always think five positive things that you can do with a student. Our, my team teacher would take five paper clips and he would move it to the other pocket. And he would try to think of five positives that he could find with um, some of his more difficult students. He would do the same things with the kids that were not just the difficult students, but he wanted to give students at least five positives, even to that one negative. We know it's important every time we meet with a student. Every word you speak, every moment you have is an opportunity to make a difference in the life of the child that you're with. And it does matter. And then, you know, doing those classroom group contingencies, you know, if kids are doing really good and they're really getting the lesson, give them all praise. You know, give them all those things. Now, do we give classroom consequences? Was everybody in class, you know, making poor choices? No, you cannot give classroom, you know, like nobody's getting recess today. I said that a million times probably in my first year. Where everybody's losing five minutes of recess. I didn't know that it wasn't appropriate that everybody had to lose it because over half the class was acting up. I didn't know those things. But now that I do, now I know like, okay, there was five people that didn't do what they were supposed to do. That does not mean that the entire class has to suffer. So those five kids are going to be retaught my expectations during a preferred time of theirs. Not their whole time. I was never a person that would take the entire recess or silent lunch. Those things, that's just setting yourself up for failure because they can't get that energy out. So having those five um, students learn the expectations that you had for them again. Everyone pretty much likes to be praised, but you got to find out some of your kids you know that do not like to be praised in person or out loud in front of everybody. Then you might walk over and, you know, instead of interrupting or doing anything, just stick the note on there and keep moving. If they can't read, you know, maybe it's a sticker of great job or just smaller words, you know, depending on your student grade level, you know, what's appropriate. You didn't interrupt, you just go over, you stick it on and you keep moving. Kids love those notes. Clip charts, a lot of schools still use clip charts. If kids are doing things right, that's great, and you wanna praise that. But if you start taking away those things, one, it's kinda of like a public humiliation thing. If I were in here and I saw people on their phone, and I started taking your name and clipping it up, would you all be embarrassed? I mean, I, there was one lady, it was funny, in one of my trainings, she was an eye roller. And I was like, you know, if I put her down here, which she knew, you know, she was part of it. But she still was like, that's so embarrassing. And I'm like, it is. So for kids, you're labeling them in front of the entire classroom because you're going to have kids that stay on yellow or orange. You're going to have the same kids usually on the green and the blue and the purple. But those other kids are always going to be labeled like the kids that cause issues and you're doing it in front of everybody. If you're going to reprimand a kid, do it in silence. You know, like do it over, get that audience away talk to them quietly. If you have to take a kid in the hallway or if you have to move all your kids somewhere to talk to that kid if he's, you know, at a different level, whatever it takes, do that in private. The whole class doesn't have to know that you don't like what that student's doing at that moment. We're gonna skip that one. So creating a plan for classroom management. When you go into your classroom, think about the things that you wanna teach. Start making a checklist. These are the behaviors that I need to teach in my classroom. Do I need to teach how to do a reading group? Do I need to teach how much time they have to get from one end of the hallway to the other? Do I need to teach what it looks like in cafeteria? Make a list for all those things. You want the least interruptions possible. This works for middle, elementary, high, hand signals. You can keep teaching and keep it moving. Kids know when to use them. You teach them that, hey, Five minutes after the bell rings or 10 minutes you can't use the bathroom or 10 minutes before class is over, you can't use the bathroom. You gotta teach that. This is something that we did if you need to go to the bathroom, you raised your hand like this. This meant bathroom. If I see a student doing that and I'm teaching, I could just go, like go on to the bathroom. Don't even have to miss a step, don't have to interrupt class, don't have to wait for those back and forth conversations because some kids can't handle, I'm even that way, that interruption because then they've forgotten everything you taught them five minutes prior because of that small interruption. Um, water, same thing, keep it moving. 
Put up your hand signal, close fist. Man, I have a question. Raise hand means they were going to answer something or they have something to say. This is a good way to keep class going, no interruptions. Teach them what it looks like, teach them how to use it appropriately. Task and time. I put everything on a timer because I'm bad and I get going over time limit too. So if I were going to assign a task, I might say, hey, guys, we're going to read. We're going to read chapter one and you have five minutes. So your task is to read chapter one. You have five minutes. What are we going to, what's your task? How much time do you have? Five minutes. And you just check with your students. Now, if he got it wrong, I might go over it to him and say, okay, so what was the task? And he's going to tell me. Then we're going to go back to him and we're going to say, what's the task? That way the kids are all following about what's about to happen and how much time they have to do it. And if they forget, you keep asking until somebody gets it right. And then you go back through every student. I know it takes a minute, but it's so much easier than trying to redirect them the whole time the lesson's going on because they've already forgotten what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so that's just another way to utilize the time in your class, setting class timers. I love online stopwatch. Kids can watch it go. They know how much time they have to complete something. Timer goes off. What does it look like when the timer goes off? You teach that. You have the kids sit at their desk, timer goes off. Maybe they're elementary, they put their arms like this when the timer goes off and their eyes are on you. That was my expectation. Timer goes off, arms follow the eyes on me. That meant they were ready to work. And I'm sure you all might have known this teacher back in the day. I did. I could still hear her, her heels clicking across the hardwood floor. She had a million rolls, and I was terrified. But I, I, she was a really great teacher. But you couldn't hear a pin drop. There was no interactions, no loud voices. Um, I definitely always got in trouble for talking or chewing bubble gum in her class. Um, but you couldn't even speak unless you were spoken to. So, or she'd break that yardstick across your desk and scare you to death. So... I was still at the times when you could get paddled. We're going to skip the virtual classroom procedures for now, but you can see this is still the things that you can teach. Um, like these are just a list. You can find these online. These are free, so you don't have to recreate the wheel of all the things you might want to teach in the classroom. And then, you know, we're not going to do this, but I want you all to think about maybe when you get home, creating a classroom procedure checklist, things that you know maybe you need to teach that you didn't or things that you're gonna to need to teach day one of the classroom. Think about those expectations that you wanna teach because then you're being proactive. You're teaching the kids the expectations. So when they come in, then if they don't do it correctly, you can reteach the behavior, show them how to do it again, give them a little bit of time because you know they might need a little more practice. Then if you see that they're just not doing it because they don't wanna do it, then you can talk about discipline and how what your all's discipline system might be in your classroom or your school-wide uh, discipline policy. You know, think about making sure your rules are everywhere. They're posted in every area that the students are in. Having those visual cues, especially for special education students, we know works a lot better when they can see that visually, what that might look like. You know, it's gonna look different for high school. Teaching and modeling transitions, hallway expectations, what that looks like, no matter what grade level kids need to know what it looks like with or without an adult in the hallway. So, you know, you want to teach and model everything that you do behavior-wise. You teach it, model it, you know, have those kids um, show, practice it, and then have them show you they can do it over and over until you know that they've got it because you cannot teach academics until you have your behavior under control. And I learned that the hard way my first couple of years. I said if I could go back, you know, 10, 10 12 years ago, I would be dangerous in the classroom because I know all these things that I didn't know then. So you've got your classroom procedures and things in place. <clears throat> you know, think about what kind of students you have in your classroom. You want to make sure everybody feels included, seen, heard, um, students with disabilities, you know, making sure students understand what that means. And I, we don't have to tell them that, oh, so-and-so has a disability. No, but you can have books in your classroom about certain disabilities. You can have books that look like those students, things that are relation, relational to the students in the classroom to help build that community and help everyone feel like they're a part of your classroom. Um, special education students having manipulative baskets. I am big on, again, working smarter, not harder. I want you all to think about the things that you can do. IEPs are hard to look at. We know it's like 10 pages. 
Nobody has time for that at the beginning of the year. But you can do a little snapshot. You know, this is your people. These are the things that they get. So you know that that's their um, accommodations at the beginning of the year. You have that little sheet just to glance at. Okay, I know he gets extra time, so in your mind, it's easier to look at that than a 10 or 15 page IEP. So creating something for yourself may be a little bit more work at the beginning, but it makes it easier throughout the year. You can do something like this. You can keep this with your sub plans too, so that people comes in, your special area teacher, so that they know that these kids get those accommodations. Teach your students in your classroom, whether you're special ed or regular ed, their accommodations so they know to ask. That's one of the things that I didn't learn till like fourth year of special ed, like teach your kids to ask for those accommodations. Teach them to own that this is theirs. You know, they're not gonna get it unless they ask with some people. Um, you know, having something like this for when subs come in, that way they know what to expect. They know what's going on. Um, they know that a student might need a little extra support. You can create your own. Again, they have tons of free ones online if you don't wanna recreate the wheel. A lot of special education teachers and regular education teachers don't have enough time to collaborate. But if you don't know something about a student or you don't understand a disability, talk to them, research it, ask for help. I encourage you to collaborate with your special education teachers as much as possible or vice versa because you are a team and that student has the responsibility of everyone. I used to hate when somebody would say, hey, I need you to come get your student. And I would be like, my student? What about your student? <laughs> about our student it would drive me crazy because I was like you know this is a shared relationship here so we have to all take responsibility for those students making sure you do your behavior plans and your behavior charts making sure that you're making a way to plan to do behavior charts it can be time-consuming but by law those have to be done for your special education students so if it's checking little smiley faces and I know it takes time put it on that clipboard get it done because it's both the responsibility of special education teacher and regular education teacher to make sure it's getting done. Your climate and your classroom is gonna reflect everything that you are. Your kids are going to reflect everything that you are. And I say that not to like stress you out, but because you know if they're learning and the climate in their classroom is good, it's gonna show in everything they do. The way that their behavior is in other classrooms is gonna reflect you too. Now, are there gonna be issues with certain students? Yes. But it, honestly, they are going to be a reflection of everything that you teach them in the classroom. These are just some books that I had in my classroom um, to help kids understand autism, you know, different things, uh, different disabilities. There's tons of things out there that you can include so that kids understand without saying, oh, so and so is this or that. Um, these are just some different books of accepted second grade core content, Cinderella, fairy tales. There is tons of Cinderella stories with all kinds of different um, cultures around the world. That's a great way to help kids understand the world around them. And kids that might be coming in from, I know there's a lot of foster care situations so that you have kids coming from all over the state or all over across the country. And now you've got to learn about some of the things that might be different than what they're used to. Teaching those things and teaching acceptance. Bucket filling is a great way to also do something positive in your classroom if you've never done this. There's a book, and then you can always have like kids do positive interactions. Learn to say compliments to kids because it talks about keeping your bucket full for adults and kids alike. Um, that was something that my class did. They really enjoyed it. And then at the end of the week, we would put the bucket fillers in a basket and draw so many names in order for them to receive something special because they, you know, been kind or um, things like that. I want to make sure I'm on time. There we go. Um, oh, didn't mean to do that. Preparing for change. I don't like change most of the time, so I like to know when something's going to be different. Prepare your students for change. Now, one of my students, I could not. I'd just be have to tell him on the way something was happening because if I told him beforehand, my son's the same way, he would worry himself to death. So sometimes some kids, you just have to learn which kids do well with that and which kids do not. But preparing for change is a good thing for most of your classroom. You will have that select few that don't do well with it. Um, so just kind of prepare for those situations. Emergency sub plans. We know that this year has been crazy. Um, the last three, two or three years, and even before that, nobody wants to come in and do sub plans when they're sick. Nobody. 
I don't care who you are. So having um, emergency sub plans, it takes a little work in the beginning, but just having a box with your lesson plan, your student list, student ambassadors that can you know assist with things, um, emergency sub lists, have those snapshots with the IP snapshots, um, your computer login, have them your little tech guy that does that. Again, just a little positive note as you're going by. Giving those little positive vibes throughout the day helps kids feel so much better. They feel so confident when you do things like that. Um, having your behavior sheet, all those things in that sub box is gonna help that sub continue on without you know missing a beat. They might not be able to teach your lesson plans because you didn't have time, but have folders of work that they have already done that they can practice on, core content that they've already had in your emergency sub plans. Have those folders ready. It's so much easier than trying to come in, you know, 102 degree temp, sick, or, you know, trying to get that to your team member to do. Because nobody really has the time, but they're going to do it because that's your team member and they're going to be there for you. But, you know, not expecting that from people. And then including your kids in meetings and things that are going on in your class. Student voice is important. Students are gonna let you know things that are bothering them or they think that changes that need to occur. Include them in your um, things that are going on in your classroom, all the meetings. Maybe have some student voice on some of the committees throughout your building. You'd be surprised and don't pick the kids that just you know always do the right thing. Pick those kids that are difficult or hard because you know sometimes they have a lot more to say than we, <laughs> than we give them credit for. So, you know, include every kid, you know, every student voice. Build those foundations. And, you know, just think about for your school year. Again, teaching those expectations, your transitions. How are you going to give them praise? How are you going to reward them? You know? Um, think about your data collection system and how often you're going to look, like, look at that in the classroom. You're going to be expected to do data for, you know, big meetings and stuff. But how are you going to do it in the classroom? How are you going to follow your student behavior? Um, think about, you know, every day when you come in, whatever happened with the student the day before, you leave it at the door. You can't hold grudges. You got to come in, you let it go. You had a terrible fight with your spouse. Come in the door, you got to let it go. Dog ran away. Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> you got to let it go. Then you can be texting somebody if you need to in the meantime and say, where's my dog? Or have y'all seen it? But you gotta let it all go at the door because those kids need every second of every day of you all. No matter the good, the bad, the ugly, they're there for you. And they might drive you crazy, but guess what? When you're not there, they are so worried about you. They're the one person that's like, hey, wonder where Mrs. So-and-so is. Wonder why they're not here. They will worry themselves to death. And it will be the student that drives you the craziest. But those are the kids that, you know, are there for you every single day. They don't miss. They don't miss school. You know, those are the kids. They never miss school, the ones with the most behaviors. They're there every day. But be there for them. Be present. Give them everything you have and don't give up. Build those relationships because nothing is going to work in your classroom until you have that relationship with that student. Not behavior. They're not going to follow your rules or expectations if they see or smell that you're being fake with them, one, because they can smell it. But just be real with them. Let them see sides of you that they might not, not necessarily know. You know, it's okay to share that you have kids, that you have dogs, that, you know, you have a farm or whatever. Share some of those good things and bad things with them so kids know you're human. You know, sometimes they just need that. And then this is just something that I want you all to think about emotional well-being of teachers 48 percent responded that they were okay last year 52 percent responded that they were not doing okay teaching is hard but we can be proactive instead of reactive do everything you can to build those positive behavior interventions and supports in your classroom have those positive interactions with those students that's what's going to make the biggest difference in your classroom because again, you cannot teach academics until your behavior is in place. It just can't be done. You'll be spending your entire year putting out fires. And you know, just take care of yourselves. Take care of your teammates. Make sure that they're okay, check in with them. And again, um, I always review my expectations at the beginning and the end. 
just like a teacher classroom, regular classroom. So we learned about some positive behavior interventions and supports. I hope you can find one thing that you take back to your classroom that was useful. Um, I always say if you can go to a training and get just one thing, to me that's, you know, that's something, um, especially if it helps. To review tier one interventions to start the school year, refresh those classroom strategies, whether virtual or in person, we know that that has to take place. But just really, you know, think about what you have to give every single day and you have to, you know, be strong some days more than you want to be. Um, but those kids are waiting for you guys to come in. They're waiting on you every single day. And most of them, I'd say 99.9% .9 of your classroom can't wait to see you when they get there every day. So just remember that.